Um, Dr. Wiesman has uh, indicated his interest to make this as an interactive experience as possible. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. And so um, just to read his bio, Dr. Andreas uh, Wiesman is an assistant professor of aviation and a passionate aviation enthusiast. He has served for 27 years in the United States Air Force, traveling the world as a combat rescue pilot, instructor pilot, and deployed rescue squadron commander. During this time, he has developed a vast treasure trove of aviation stories that he uses to enhance presentations and facilitate learning. In a modern age of technology, do we rely too heavily on videos, PowerPoint, and Prezi presentations? Make your lectures and presentations more effective and improve connections between students and material. Let Andreas help you rediscover the lost art of storytelling. Thank you. All right. Um, I've started my PhD program and not finished, so uh, not quite a doctor yet. When you look at this slide, what do you see? What images come to your mind? What do you think about? Grass. Grass. Exactly. I grew up in the Salt Lake Valley, and I loved to go lay out on a hot summer day on the cool grass. I did like snow angels. I could feel the blades of grass running through my fingers. And I'd watch the clouds go by. But not just the clouds. I would see the birds soaring in the air. And I'd watch the airplanes flying in to Salt Lake International Airport. It was, it was a thrill for me to live there and every day see those airplanes. And they had my name on it, the big W's flying overhead for Wiesman Airlines. At least that's what I thought when I was a child. That's what I wanted to do. My grandmother lived in Germany, and every year we'd go pick her up. And I would spend time on the observatory that no longer exists on top of the terminal where you could watch all the airplanes. And I would beg my mother to go there early to watch the airplanes. I want to be there. Sadly, as a son of a single-parent immigrant mother with three kids, by the time I was 10 or 12, I realized that dream of flying, I don't think it was going to happen. That idea that I had that I could go out there and learn how to fly seemed like something that wouldn't happen. But then one day, I got a letter in the mail. And I actually have that letter right here. It was 1980. It said, they're announcing the 1981 National Scout Jamboree in Fort Apey Hill, Virginia. Come to the scout, Scouting's Reunion with History. Go to New York City, Washington, D.C., Philadelphia, Valley Forge, Gettysburg, Amish Country, Williamsburg, King's Dominion. Could you even imagine this little boy from the Salt Lake Valley traveling outside of Utah, east of the Mississippi, get to go to our nation's historic sites? For me, that was important. My mother came over from Germany, and she instilled those values of patriotism and appreciation for our country. And I knew that was important. She earned her citizenship in 1974. She asked me to put a flag on the house. And here I could go back to the birthplace of our country and experience all the thrill. Then I got to the bottom of the letter. The cost, $1,120. I took the letter and I set it down. I said, how in the world am I going to get that amount of money? Now here I am, I'm just a 13-year-old kid. Where am I going to come up with that? Well, my sister said, Andreas, if that's something you want to do, you'll figure out a way. And right there I thought, if there's a way that I can still achieve that dream, I need to go do it. So we had a, a bakery in town. We'll see if this works. And I remember seeing all these young boys about my age cleaning up in the back. And it was called Roger's Bakery. They gave out free cookies too. You know, who likes free cookies? So you'd go over there and be nice and get a free cookie. So I went into the bakery and I said, hey, is, is Mr. Roger there? Well, I found out his first name is Roger. It's Roger Hayes. And they said, well, he's not here tonight. Come back tomorrow. Went home rejected. Next day, hey, I'd like to talk to Mr. Roger about getting a job. He comes out and says, look, I'm really busy. It's deer hunting season this weekend. Come back next weekend. You know. Third time's the charm. I went back next week and talked to him. He said, I don't know, you know, I'm kind of busy getting ready for a catering event. And I went home dejected, thinking, I'm not going to be able to do this. And my sister once again said, Andreas, if you want to do this, you figure out a way. So the next Monday, I, with resolve, went back to the bakery. And I saw Mr. Roger there, and I said, Roger, tell you what. 
I'd been listening to these Zig Ziglar tapes, cassettes, remember cassettes? And one of his cassettes talks about what you have to do. And I said, I'll work for free tonight. I'll work for free, and at the end of the night, if you like what you see, you can hire me, and if I enjoy it, then I'll accept. He looked at me, takes off his apron, throws it at me, and said, go talk to Mike Banks in the back. Little did I know that the other boy who was supposed to help out hadn't shown up. So fortune was in my favor that night. I worked real hard. We got done about 9 o'clock, and I talked to Roger at the end of the night. I said, hey, I had a lot of fun. What do you think? He goes, that's the earliest you two boys have been done in weeks. You're hired. I was excited. I got a job. I had a way now that I could earn that money. A week later, I get my first paycheck, and I look in there. It's $50. And Roger goes, what's wrong? I said, um, sir, nothing. I like getting paid, but the deposit's due, and I didn't make enough for the deposit. I'm short $75. He pulls out his wallet, hands me the 75 He goes, I'll take it out of your next paycheck. You go get your dream. For the next nine months, I worked at the bakery, and I got to go to the Jamboree. I was able, oh, by the way, on the far left side, that is my brother. He became one of the family, and these are all of Roger's kids at Magnet. Has anybody been out to Reams Bakery in Magnet? Best donuts around ever. But I worked there for four and a half years. I went to the Jamboree. That's me with Bill Birch. I got to go to Gettysburg. I went to Washington, D.C. I went to the Smithsonian. Do you remember? I loved aviation. I was there in the Smithsonian. I was able to realize that aspect of my dream. So a few, a few months later, I came back, and my friend there in the middle, Chris Sundstrom, introduced me to Civil Air Patrol. And if I had a little bit more time, I'd go into a lot of detail about that experience. But Civil Air Patrol, who knows what Civil Air Patrol is? Anybody heard of it? Auxiliary Air Force, get to learn how to fly airplanes. I was in heaven. That's me on the left there, and my friend on the right, Dave Yeager. So Civil Air Patrol, I got to go out in the mountains, and thank you. The first thing we did was learn about survival. So does anybody recognize what that is on the screen? What is that called? Deadfall. Yeah, deadfall. It's a figure four. Who said that? Gold star to the man. Figure four. So I actually got to do some real things out there. Got to go down to Camp Williams and do uniform inspections and march around. And I actually got to, to earn some ribbons. And that was a lot of fun. But what was my goal? To become a pilot. 1985, April, through Civil Air Patrol, I got a solo scholarship. Paid for all my flying through solo. Now, I think this is the first official selfie. I didn't coin the term back in 1985. But in April of 1985 at Provo Airport, I got to go out there and take off in an airplane by myself. That, to me, was achieving my dream. Now, I want to talk about storytelling today and how we can use stories. Now, in, I think it was Courtney's presentation, he said, everybody wants to know the superhero's background story, right? How did they become a superhero? Whether it's Spider-Man or Superman or Batman, you want to know the background story. Well, to those students in your class, you're their superhero, especially if it's something like aviation, because I think aviation is cool. Who here, what other career fields do we have? Any mathematicians? No, okay, so, so there you were. You're lost in your Fibonacci sequence trying to sort out Pythagorean theorem. I don't know how that relates to storytelling, but somehow maybe it does. So you've got to find stories. What about music? Any, anybody music here? Okay, who's seen the movie Mr. Holland's Opus? Ah, there's a great story in that movie. Do you remember when one of the students was struggling and couldn't understand? He goes, let me tell you a story. And he takes Stadler out. He says, I'm going to do a research project this Saturday. And he told him the story about his struggling student who was on the football team. He learned how to play a drum, who went and served with the military. That's a powerful story. And it changed Stadler's life. Do you remember when the young girl was struggling playing the clarinet? What was the story that he asked her about? He goes, what do you like about yourself? What did she say? Anybody remember? Her hair. It was a, a brilliant reddish-orange hair. Well, what do you like about your hair? Well, my dad said it reminds him of the sunset. So he takes that story out of her, and he said, play the sunset. And she does. If you've not seen that movie as a teacher, you need to see that movie at least once a year. 
So today let's talk about the lost art of storytelling. What do we do to help improve our teaching by engaging the students? First and foremost, they want to know who we are. So why, do you, why else do we want to tell stories? Why else do we want to tell stories in the classroom? An attention getting thing, yeah. Give context. Give context, okay? So you take something that's abstract and you're able to relate it to something that they can do and this that they can appreciate. You know, when you look at Mr. Holland's opus, again, about music, he was trying to explain to him about Beethoven. What happened, I don't want to spoil the, too much of the movie, so I'd be careful, but he's trying to talk about Beethoven and help his students understand this masterpiece. And he talks about it and says, Beethoven, in the last years of his life when he wrote this, was totally deaf. He, he couldn't hear the music anymore. He would be up there in front of the orchestra, waving his arms with the music in his mind, perfect but yet the orchestra was struggling to keep up with him because he couldn't hear the music. Do you see how that engages the students by telling them powerful stories? So here are some practical things. The oral tradition, this is what happened before the written language, before iPads and laptops. It was the oral stories. Who has family stories that are told from grandpa in your family? Stories about, you know, whether you're here in Logan, possibly pioneer stories. My stories about my mother. You know, you, you see the end of World War II where my mother grew up in East Prussia. She was actually kicked out by the Russians. And my grandmother would tell me the stories that they would ride the train until they came to a bombed out bridge and they would walk for miles out of Russia, out of Prussia, into Czechoslovakia. By that time, the war ended. And through the Red Cross, she got to northern Germany. And this story in my family is important to me because it shows the dedication that my mother had into trying to get away from that oppression. And then the story about her coming to America. So those family stories are important. And those, if you don't write them down, what happens when those memories fade? And that's another story about journaling. Okay. Uh, so word of mouth was the first way that we learned. And guess what? If you tell a story in class and the kids like, what are they going to do? They're going to repeat it, aren't they? They're going to go home and say, you'll never guess what I learned today. And they're going to tell those stories. Stories are memorable. They connect it. So that's why it's important. Um, we have a lot of his, historical allegories, right? For example, if I was going to say, who chopped down the cherry tree, who, what would you say? I cannot tell a lie. Right? Is that story true? Were there any, any historians in here? Yeah, there's a lot of dispute whether that's a true story or not. But how many of you heard that growing up in elementary school, right? Why did they tell you that story? To be honest. They were teaching you to be honest. So whether it's a true story or not, sometimes doesn't matter because there's a moral. There's a, there's a principle there. But the caveat, and, and my boss is back there, make sure you tell them that when you say, there I was, either you really were there or you weren't. So, you know, was it 90% true or 10% true? I forgot what you told me. So, All right. Uh, when should you use the stories? When should you use stories? What are some contexts of situations? Anyone? Bueller? I like to use them when I see the Yeah. That's a great opportunity to, to engage them again. Remember, if you've been to the, the opening and you talked about flipping a classroom, more engaging with them is better. The old lecture that you see in Ferris Bueller's, anyone? Class? Anyone? I mean, I think we've all been there once or twice in our careers, would hate to admit it, but sometimes it's been a long day. But you want to engage them. When else can you use it? How did I use the story today? How did it work? Yeah? And you start thinking, who is this guy? What, what makes him tick? You started asking those questions in your mind about what's this important, how it all comes together, right? So using it as an opening is a very powerful way. And just like an opening, using a story as a closing right before they leave the classroom to sum everything up. Say, we've talked about principles X, Y, and Z today, and this is why it's important. I've told you how important it is to check your heading, your altimeter, and make sure all your instruments are good. If you take off in an airplane, you're off by one degree, and you go 60 miles, the 60 to 1 rule, math, tells you how far off course am I in 60 miles. 60 to 1 rule, it is one mile. Even the non-math majors can understand that. So if I'm off one degree and I go 60 miles, I'm a mile off course. What if I go 60 miles? How far am I off course? 
10 miles. Well, then I tell him a story of Bernie Fisher in Vietnam who lost his instruments in his airplane flying over the crowded jungle and it was clouded cover that day. And he knew he had to get back home and he thought, well, if I reverse my course and I fly this speed at this altitude for this long, I should be right over the valley between the two mountains where our airfield is. So guess what he did? He flew his airplane, hacked his watch, watched his speed, trusted himself and spiraled down through the clouds where he was blind and he was one quarter away from his airfield. And he was able to land in between the mountains of the jungle. Do you see how that's powerful now? Attention grabbers. Oh, let's see what happened here. Powerful closings and tie in over many lessons. That's one thing I love about some of the stories I tell in aviation is I can tell a part of the story today and two lessons down the road, I'll say, do you remember the story where I talked about my dream becoming a pilot? Well, let me tell you something else about that story. I can integrate something else into it. And this way, if you remember something in your story, you can link it again. And that becomes a tie-in over time. So there's a lot of ways to do that. So this is a little mini story. Sometimes you don't have time for a long story. So this right here is a statue of the Air Force Academy, a gift from the French Air Force Academy to the U.S. Okay? Frank, can you read that for us, please? What do you think that means? Yeah. And I, I have a, a, a presentation that I give to youth where I talk about flying and how important that knowledge is. And if you, if you don't keep learning and training and developing, what happens to the fuel in your fuel tank? You start to run out. But I want you to see something else up there on this besides that. Um, let's see if I can get the... There you go. Okay. We don't want to do that. <laughs> At least doesn't say, shutting down. Okay, look up here on the statue, the eagle and fledglings. What's next to the eagle? Two little fledglings. They're eaglets, baby eagles. When I first saw this at the Air Force Academy, I go, I'm one of those little guys on the, on the edge of that precipice there. And the eagle's the upperclassman. And they're teaching us and getting us ready to fly. And they're going to kick us out the door someday. Well, literally that happened to me at the Air Force Academy. I got to go jump out of the airplane. And you get there, you get your parachute on after two weeks of training. And he goes, okay, stand by, stand in the door, green light. And they tell you to go. What they don't tell you is there's a boot on your butt pushing you out the airplane in case you hesitate. So I'm sitting there and I get to jump, just like an eagle getting pushed out of the nest. I get to fly down. Great experience. And so after I jumped out of the airplane, every time I walked by that statue, I was no longer thinking about the academic, which is important, but I was actually thinking about what? Flying. Every time I walked by that statue, I thought of that. We'll come back to that in a little bit. So let's look at some other aspects here. The purpose of stories. Okay? To teach an idea. So when you're going through your lectures, find opportunities to take everyday examples. Things that happen to you every day. Why do you want to do that? How many of you have jumped out of an airplane? Anybody free fall parachutes in here? You have? Excellent. Tandem jump? Did you scream the whole way down? Oh, very nice. She's very on. Anybody else? Yeah? So two of you can relate to that. Everybody else is saying, I ain't going near a door of an airplane when it's open in flight, right? You aren't going to get me close to that. So using everyday examples, the students can relate to it better. You know, that one time when you were driving through Bear Canyon and you uh, up to Bear Lake, Logan Canyon, and you come around the corner, and what do you see on the road? What do you see up in the canyon? Not deer, not elk. Cows. Okay, this is night. It's dark. And there's like a dozen black Angus cows on the road in front of me. And thank goodness I was driving the speed limit, had my bright headlights on, and I was able to stop in time. But could you imagine that? So talk about force, mass acceleration, object at rest, we made at rest until moved upon by an outside force. Newton's law. So, yeah, so teach an idea. Um, simpler developed. A lot of times we talk about, you know, you think you want to have a big story. So let's talk about, anybody here been on sports teams? Yeah, you, you have a long season, and what do you do right before region or state? What do you do? The level of intensity does what? Increases, right? You increase the level of intensity, you get rid of the distractions. Well, in the airplane, we call that sterile cockpit. Whenever you're close to the ground, below 10,000 feet ready to land, no more talking about movies, no more talking about families. 
Why do you think we want a sterile cockpit? Focus. Focus. So you can get out a handy dandy laser pointer and you can talk about what happens when you focus all your energies on one goal. You focus it, you pinpoint, you can be very accurate. So you can use little objects to help reinforce your stories and be able to develop for your students. Um, create links. We talked about creating links with the abstract and real. You know, we can talk a lot about why it's important to prepare for emergencies. And then I can talk about Sully Sullenberger. Who was Sully Sullenberger? Someone in back. Miracle in the Hudson. You know, he's a fellow Air Force Academy graduate. He was a soaring instructor pilot. He did a lot of cool things. He's one of my heroes. I got to meet him at the Air Force Academy, which is another story for another day. But he said two words when I talk about his story, and I can do a long story, short story, but two words that show the kind of character he had when the chips were down. Double engine flame out, low to the ground, heavy, full load of passengers over one of the most crowded airspaces and cities in the world. Not a lot of places to land. Out here, if you lose an engine, there's a lot of fields. Just got to dodge the cows. But he said two important words when the first officer was flying. He goes, my aircraft. What does that mean, those two simple words? It means I'm in charge. I take responsibility. It means that I understand the gravity of the situation. Those two important words, and he was able to land that safely. And then when he gets on the ground, after everything that was so perfectly timed, he gets everybody on the wing, then he walks back to the back of the airplane. Not once, but twice to make sure everybody's out. Then he goes to the front and per airline regulations, puts on his hat, walks out of the wing, on, onto the wing of the airplane, knowing that everybody was out safely. That's the second miracle. He actually had to send an email to his library saying, um, I checked a book out a week ago and unfortunately I'll be unable to return it. Please let me know how much I owe for the book that won't be returned. That's the character of Sully Sullenberger. So, where can you find great stories? Where do you find great stories? History. History. Absolutely. There's plenty of great stories. Do you only want to tell the stories where everything turned out okay? The ones that make you look real good? Sometimes, you know, you want to tell those stories of where it didn't turn out so well. One of the uh, Air Force Academy seminars is on character integrity. And this general comes in about when he was an F-15 pilot 15 years ago as a captain. They're doing an exercise over Japan. And in this exercise, they're doing some air-to-air -air maneuvers. And if everybody understands what G-loads are, that's, that's how much weight you can put when you're pulling Gs in an airplane. Like roller coasters, you're weightless over the top, that's zero G. Right now, you're all in one G. And at the bottom of the loop, it's two to four Gs. Well, there's a limit on the airplane of seven rolling Gs, 7.2. And when he gets done with his maneuvers, he looks over there and guess what the G meter said? 7.25. So he looks over there and goes, how accurate is that gauge? You see, if he over G's the airplane, he's got to terminate the maneuvering at the international event. He's got to go back, land on the ground and talk to maintenance. It's going to take him 48 hours to tear all the panels off, inspect it to make sure there's no cracks in the spars and to be able to release that airplane. Or he could just reach up and reset it. Back then it wasn't digital, there's no data. I mean, no one would be the wiser. Save face, right? Because, I mean, pilots were cool guys. We don't want to admit that we made a mistake. What do you think you did? What do you think you did? He did. He reset the G meter and continued the mission. He goes, I've made thousands and thousands of decisions over the 25 years in the Air Force. But that one decision haunts me. There was an F-15 that broke apart a few years ago. I talked to him. He said he looked online to see the tell number. It wasn't the one that he flew. He goes, I wish I could go back and say I had the, the integrity to do the right thing that day. But I didn't. And he goes, it haunts me. You don't remember all the good decisions you made every day, but you make a decision like that where it affects not just your life, but everybody else who's going to fly that airplane. He goes, you wonder. You wonder about that. 
And the room was silent with all those cadets sitting there because here's this big three-star general. Pretty unfortunate. So everyday examples. Look from your life. I love to talk about my children. They're my heroes. And you want, to, want them to, to do well. So I have this fantasy. Okay, My wife and I are walking through Toys R Us. And the kids don't touch any of the toys. Okay, So we're walking down the aisles. We actually give them a quarter. And they keep the quarters... Uh, this is PG, okay? So I don't know what you guys are thinking. So, so we have these quarter, and if they behave, they get to keep it. That day, all four kids kept the quarter. They behaved. So we're at dinner, and at the dinner, there's some candy machines at the restaurant, and everybody wants their candy. My oldest wants his hot tamales, and my, my youngest wants to get the sweet tarts. But Jordan, he walks over there and sees a can on the counter. I don't remember the girl's name, fighting leukemia. He's reading it. You know, he's probably about seven or eight years old, he's asking me the words. And then he looks up at me and he drops the quarter into the can. And I kind of go, Jordan, I thought, I thought you wanted to buy some candy. I do, Dad. But I think she needs my money more than I need it right now. A simple everyday story can teach a powerful lesson. Okay? Look for those experiences in your life. Um, and uh, I'm going to pick it up a little bit since we're running out of time. So, again, I talked about parables and true stories. Let them know if it's based upon real events, okay, <laughs> versus whether it is or not, okay? Um, Wrath of Bath, very, very quick story. This is usually a, a very long story. I was in pilot training. Remember my dreams go to pilot training? And if you don't do so well, they go to a progress check ride or an elimination check ride. Lieutenant Colonel Bath was a squadron commander. The Wrath of Bath. No one had ever passed that. And I had a little problem. So if everybody puts out their hand on a, on a, on a stick, we're going to fly an airplane. So what happens if you look to the left? Everybody look to the left with your stick out there. Yeah, what happens? You, you do that, right? Hey, look over there. And you go off the road. Well, in an airplane, you do the same thing. I overbanked in the final turn. So I have to go to this elimination check ride with Colonel Bath. The wrath of Bath. And the flight commander, this is the pep talk he gives me. No one's ever passed. And I'm thinking, well, you're saying that because no one ever has. But he said, no one's ever passed. And I'm thinking, how's that a, a, a pep talk to help me out? Okay, so I went home and I practiced. Look left, don't move the hand. Look left, don't move the hand. Skill fly straight and level. And I went over and over. We call that chair flying. Well, I was able to go the next day and fly. And I, I made sure when I was in the final turn, I didn't move that hand. I looked for the runway and I landed. I get done. I go into the office and sit down. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. He goes, well, I just want to let you know what happened up there. Sir, I flew everything perfectly. I was in the turn. I didn't overturn. And he goes, no, 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 you did great. No, what happened the other ride? Did you have a brain burp or something? And I'm going, what do you mean, sir? He goes, you passed. I'm going, but inside I'm going, yeah! But there I am, I'm standing going, I have no idea what he said. For the next three or four minutes, all I know is I'm going, I passed, I passed. The wrath of bath, the curse is over, you know? He goes, get out of here, Lieutenant. I don't want to see you again. I walked down the hall. I must have been white. I have no idea. I walked in the room and people start consoling me. And I'm going, no, I passed. I finished. I graduated. I'm on. Well, there's an epilogue. The flight commander had his wife call my wife. By the time I got home, she was crying because she told him that I had washed out of pilot training because no one had ever passed the wrath of bath. The reason I tell you that story is fast forward about eight years when I'm a flight commander. and We have a student who is struggling. And guess what? He's going to an elimination check ride. So I call him into my office, and now I know not how to give him a pep talk. <laughs> and I say, look, I went through this. You can go through this. And I talked to him. He went to his ride and came back. We gave him a call sign, Lazarus, because he came back from the dead. <laughs> so uh, there's my next selfie. That's in an F-16 upside down over Nellis Air Force Base. Uh, I did get my wings. I went on to fly in the military. Um, I got to be a rescue combat pilot. Lots of stories. I, I love talking about that. It's a great time in my life. Uh, this is one of the missions. Uh, it's a classified mission. But you can see... Oh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, there you go. It is. Um, but, uh, so I got a call sign Baron, like the Red Baron, because I'm German. Uh, my original one was Kraut. That became politically incorrect. I go, what? I'm a sauerkraut? I'm German. I can be offended. But, so... Uh, so I just want to finish up here. Um, unfortunately, I spent too many times on storytelling, and we don't have a lot of time to, to practice. But think about your experiences, okay? Every day, do you have a thought journal? I have one next to my bed. My wife and I talk about when I travel. Write down different ideas. When you see something, 
And you think about it, if you don't write it down, you'll forget it. So when you think, oh man, this would be a great idea for lesson four, write it down. Make sure you incorporate that into your lessons at that time. And guess what? You're going to start feeling, I've got volumes of thought journals of all the things over the years. Okay? Um, look for those teaching moments. If you're, if you're struggling with the lesson, you go, this lesson doesn't really do too well. Look for something. Talk to somebody. Talk to a friend. Practice the stories. Say, hey, I got this idea. So I want to teach the, you know, um, theory of, of evolution or something and figure out how I can do it. Try to come up with some ideas. Um, and then we were supposed to have some time to volunteer, but I'm out of time. Epilogue. There's that statue today. Guess what that statue represents now? Those are my twins at the Air Force Academy. Now who's the eagle? Who's the fledglings? My twins are on the Air Force Academy parachute team. They get to go jump out of airplanes. That's what they do in Colorado. They'll be competing in Florida this year. Um, I don't think I could be any prouder. I have got four sons. I could talk all four, but I can only talk about those two today. So when I talk about dreams, when you solo an airplane, they cut your shirt tails off. They hang them up in the building for all to see. They were going to tear that building down to model in Provo. My friend was down there. And he rescued my shirt tails. This is the actual shirt I wore when I soloed back in 1985. A little yellowed over the years, back in its rightful owner as a pilot. I challenge you every day, look for stories. I have this sign, this dream, with this underneath it in my office. And every time when the students come into my office, because I've told them this story in the opening, my introduction, the first thing they do, they walk in and they go, Professor Barron, that's your shirt tail, isn't it? Yes, it is. And all of a sudden, they go, yeah, you achieved your dream. Go out there and help your students be inspired. Good luck. Thank you.